First of all, I went through the four invasions with the Fort Marine Division. I was a Navy corpsman attached to a rifle platoon. And we were in all the assault waves. On Iwo Jima, I landed in the first wave. And uh, let me tell you what happened. The night before, they had a sketch like this, and they told us that they didn't know what was here, but they bombed it for the last couple of months or something. And uh, we we were in the first wave, and they put us in the water, and they had fib tractors about two hours before we hit the beach. After two hours, and there was the... the Everybody was getting seasick. We couldn't wait hit to hit the beach. <laughs> but when we hit the beach, um, it was quiet. They they let us on the beach the first wave. The only thing is, I noticed a Jap running in about maybe 100 yards away. He must have been going back in his position. Uh, and... Uh, my sergeant said, uh, I said, geez, I thought we were in the first wave. I said, are them Marines? He said, no, they're Japs. He said, go for cover. As soon as he said that, they opened fire. He was right alongside him. He got killed right away. As soon as we hit the beach, he got killed. So uh, after, after that, it was terrible. You couldn't. Bombs, they, they hit, they opened up with their pill, pill boxes, they had pill boxes, and the caves, we didn't know that, there was caves there, and they were hiding in the caves, but what, why were we waiting to get in, I said, nobody could su survive this, because, but when we hit the beach, I thought everything was going to be good, but then, then the second and the third wave, they opened up, and uh, we couldn't move too far, but we had to establish the beachhead. So the first day we got up to, uh, when there was a little airfield there. I don't see it here now. It was a little airstrip. We got up before there, and we banked, uh, we bunked in for the night. Uh, the next morning we started again. We start pushing. And uh, all of a sudden, I heard somebody holler, Corman. And I said, Jesus, somebody must have got hurt. Anyway, after about a, I don't know how long it was, maybe a couple of seconds, he called again. So I said, oh, I better go out there. I, and the guy told me, he said, you're taking an awful chance. You're going to get hit. He said, too much stuff flying around. But hey, that was my job. I had to do it. When I got to him, just before I got to him, I got shot, right? And that was at the end of the, uh, the airstrip. So after that, everything happened so fast. All I remember is getting taken aboard a ship, a, a hospital ship. And uh, about the third or fourth day, I heard all the ships blow their horns and everything, and it was they were raising the flag then. So that was it for me. I was shipped uh, down to Guam in an army hospital, and then I got transferred to Hawaii. And after that, I got shipped back to the East Coast, and I was in the hospital for about five months, you know. Thank you. Ed O'Donnell. And uh, I live up in the Indian Wild Lakes. And uh, I was at the 3rd Marine Division on Guam. And I run and Iwo. And uh, Iwo Jima has, means more to the O'Donnell family than just a symbolic raising of the flag. My brother Tommy, God rest his soul. 19 years old, was an A Company, 21st Marines, and he was killed on the wall on March 2nd. So uh, I missed him by three days, 
uh, my commanding officer, uh, when he heard that Tommy was in the 50 Division, he checked out exactly where the uh, the unit was located. He wrote me out a pass to get through the MPs to go around the, the island, around the mountain, to get to uh, A Company's uh, bivouac area. I got there, and the fella told me, he just missed them. They moved up to the lines. Two days later, Captain Thomas came to me and said, your brother's outfit is back in bivouac. Here's a pass, take the jeep, and get over and see him. I did it, and when I got over there, I asked a fellow where A Company was, and he pointed to him. He said their platoon leader is in that foxhole over there. His name was Kovacs. And I went over and I hollered and said, Kovacs, and he came out. And I said, I'm Ed O'Donnell. It's my brother Tommy here. And he said, I got bad news for you. He says, we were up on the lines. Your brother was a lead man. He went down on that draw, and his buddy, Polinski, came running out, hollering, Corman, Corman. That just meant one thing. And he said, Tommy was evacuated. We don't know whether he was dead or alive. But uh, I went down to, to the uh, evacuation area and tried to check the casualty list, but they didn't have Tommy. So I never found out So I was TF and it moved back to Guam that Tommy was actually buried on Iwo. Uh, that's why Iwo means a lot to the O'Donnell family. The reason that we've put this flag here, in this case, is that uh, this flag five years ago was going to be probably the last flag that was raised on Mount Suribachi at Iwo Jima. Uh, <clears throat> since then, the American government gave back the island to the Japanese, and so the Japanese is now closed. But Woody Wilson, the last surviving Medal of Honor winner, and a group of Marines every year for the last six, 60 years almost, went back and did a reenactment of the raising of the flag. This one was the last one that was raised. It was donated to our league by Bob Bolas. He went to a, a, a dinner that was after the reenactment and outbid everybody else at the dinner to gain, to gain the, the flag. And he then donated it to us four years ago. So we put it up here because we are here to reenact the event on Mount Suribachi that day. Thank you all for coming. Today, we are honored with the presence of several people whom you'll hear about later. But on this day, 75 years ago, at this very moment in time, the second flag was being raised at Mount Suribachi, Iwo Jima. We'll hear a little bit more about that later on. What I'd like to do is welcome everyone to the Marine Corps League, the Northeast Detachment, Commandant Joel Safranco, you'll hear from a little bit later. Thank you very much. And I would like to ask all of you to rise for the national anthem, the invocation, and the Pledge of Allegiance. Let's have Tom Sommerfeld. Oh,
I want to take a moment and I want everyone to look at the flag that sits in the center of our wall. Right. On February 23rd, 2015, that flag was raised over Mount Suribachi. Four years ago, it was presented to Tony Julia. Iwo Jima is only a, eight square miles in size. Yet it was the stage for the costliest battle in U.S. Marine Corps history. Over 20,000 Marines were injured. 6,800 Marines paid the ultimate sacrifice. God of peace, we gather today to remember, honor, and pray for those who served. In times of peril, you call forth courageous and selfless individuals to face the dangers of war. Now, after many years, we come to, to ask you and to grant eternal rest to those who paid that ultimate sacrifice. Oh God, how could a cloth with stars and stripes hung from a pole mean so much to us? But you know just how much the red, white, and blue is cherished by those who know the cost of our nation's freedom. For when it proudly waves, there rises in each of us a grateful appreciation for the freedoms that we enjoy. Amen. Thank you, Tom Rummerfeld. Sorry about your messing up your name. It's all right, Charlie. I'd like to call on Joel Safranco, Commandant of the Marine Corps League, for the Pledge of Allegiance. Joel. Please uncover civilians, everybody else, a tan hoot, and salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ready to. Thank you, Joel. Y'all may be seated. It's a lot of thank yous today, which I'd like to get to before I forget about them. And I want to start off by thanking the Johnson School of Technology woodworking class under Professor Todd Campbell for building the platform upon which the flag will be erected today. There are seniors here from West Granton High School under their teacher, Elizabeth DeFrancesco, who will speak on the actual six Marines who raised the flag 75 years ago today. Thank you all for coming. Not easy getting up on a Sunday, I know. The Scranton chapter of Unico, huge thank you for all your help today. There will be some light fare when we are concluded with our ceremonies. I especially want to thank Site Wyoming Detachment Alpha of the United States Marine Corps Reserve who are down there in uniform and whose sergeant I drove crazy asking if they were coming. They will take the part of the six Marines who raised the flag on Iwo Jima. And I would like to ask them to begin that process right now, Sergeant Vasquez. On that day, several hundred soldiers, several hundred Marines went up the hill. Very few came back. When they reached the top of the hill, a small flag was erected. The commanding officer thought it would be far better to get a larger flag so that it could be seen down on the seashore of the island by the ships and all the other soldiers. They did so. It was that flag, the second flag being raised, which was the, uh, became the iconic photograph of Joe Rosenthal which all of you are familiar with, I'm sure, and from which the uh, Marine Memorial in Washington was uh, the inspiration for. So when they got up to the top of the hill, they looked around for something to attach the flag to, and they found an old piece of pipe, and they struggled with the rocks and the wind, and they were able to erect the flag, and Joe Rosenthal, was not quite paying attention, according to what I read, 
And uh, the cameraman, and there's a little piece of film about this, had to say to him, Joe, take a look. And he turned and he caught that picture at that moment. And this is a 48 star flag, which was the authorized flag in 1945. Marines. Thank you. I'd like now to call upon John Sinclair, West Granton Sr., to read the biography of one of the Marines who raised the flag 75 years ago today. John? Iwo Jima was home to a pair of critical airfields. Capturing the island gave Allied forces key launching points for attacks on the main Japanese island. But the campaign proved to be one of the fiercest and bloodiest in the some 6,821 U.S. forces were killed, and another 19,217 were wounded. Estimates of Japanese casualties are as high as 18,400. The battle proved especially difficult. U.S. forces gained ground during the day, but Japanese forces would escape through a network of tunnels and return to battle the same spot the following day. Though, Rosenthal's February 23, 1945 photo was emblematic of victory, it would not be until March 26 that the battle was declared won and the island safe for occupation. The battle for Iwo Jima lasted weeks. The tallest point was Mount Suribaki, which was captured within days of the Marine landing. The officer in command of the Marine landing force was Colonel Harry B. Liversedge. Lieutenant Colonel Chandler W. Johnson, the, battle, the battalion commander, decided to send a 40-man combat patrol up to the top of the mountain and raise a flag. When the patrol did this, Lieutenant Colonel Johnson thought the original flag was too small and asked another officer to get a larger battle flag from one of the ships below. The officer returned a bit later with an 8 foot by four and one half foot flag which was fastened to the same pole the first flag was on. In the famous photo which was reenacted here the following individuals took part. Corporal Ira Hayes was born January 12, 1923 to Joseph and Nancy Hayes. He had four brothers and a sister. A member of the Pima Indian tribe in Arizona he volunteered for the Marines in August 1942. Ira Hayes saw action as a parachutist from December 1943 until February 1944 when his unit was disbanded and he was reassigned to Company E, 2nd Battalion, 28th Marines of the 5th Division. On February 23, 1945, he was one of the six who raised the flag on Mount Suribaki. In March 1945, he was ordered back to the United States as a part of a fundraising bond tour to raise money for the war. Honorably discharged in December 1945, Ira Hayes passed away in 1955. The ballad of Ira Hayes sung by Johnny Cash is a tribute to him. 
He is buried in Arlington National Cemetery. Marine Private First Class Franklin Runyon Sousley, as born September 19, 1925 in Flemingsburg, Kentucky to Merrill and Goldie Mitchell Sousley. He had two younger brothers. A year after his high school graduation, he enlisted in the Marines in 1944. He, along with Ira Hayes, located a pipe which would become the flagstaff for the larger flag. On March 21, 1945, Prickett Sousley became one of the three Marines who raised the flag to be killed in action on Iwo Jima. He was buried there in 1945 in the Marine Division Cemetery, but re-entered in 1947 in the Elizaville Cemetery in Fleming County, Kentucky. Corporal Harlan Block was born November 6, 1924 in Yorktown, Texas to Edward and Ada Bell Brantley Block. He had four brothers and a sister. Block attended West Laco High School and was remembered as an outgoing student with many friends. A natural athlete, Block led the West Laco Panther football team to the conference championship. He was honored all South Texas end. Block and seven of his friends decided on joining the Marine Corps before they graduated, and the school held a special graduation ceremony for them in January 1943. On February 23rd, Marine Sergeant Michael Strank was ordered to take three of his squad members in 2nd Platoon up to the top of Sarabaki with supplies and raise a replacement flag. He then chose Corporal Block, Assistant Squad Leader, Private First Class Ira Hayes, and Private First Class Franklin Sousley to go up with him up the mountain. Corporal Block was the second of three Marines killed on Iwo Jima after raising the flag. He was initially buried on Iwo Jima in 1945, but in 1995, he was reinterred on the grounds of the Marine Military Academy in Harlington, Texas. Celeste Juarez. Private First Carl Harold Pie Keller. Harold Pike Paul Keller, son of Byron Paul Keller and Ruth Hendrickson Keller Belland, was born on August 3rd. left it on the field. He served in the Marine Corps from January 6, 1942 to September 19, 1945 and was awarded a Purple Heart. He fought in major battles including the Battle of Midway where he survived a bullet in the neck, the Washington Post reported. Harold Keller was a Marine Raider precursor of today's Navy SEALs. Keller survived the war, married, and had three children. He passed away in 1979 and lies in Brooklyn Memorial Cemetery in Brooklyn, Iowa. A Pennsylvania resident of Pine Grove and Scunhill County named Richard Wheeler, a Marine who served with Keller, was instrumental in identifying Keller as one of the six who raised the flag. Mayor Terry Quintana. Private First Class Arnold Henry Schlotz, born to Carl and Marie Amberbowski on January 28, 1925, was the longest lived survivor of the flag raising six on Iwo Jima. He passed away at 70 in 1995 and lies in the Hollywood Forever Cemetery in Hollywood, California. The 28th Marines mission was to capture Mount Suribachi on the first day, but that did not happen due to heavy fighting. The 28th Marines reached the east side of the mountain on February 21st, and by the evening of February 22nd, had most of the mountain surrounded. On the morning of February 23rd, a 40-man patrol from the 2nd Battalion, 28th Marines, climbed up Sarabatki and succeeded in capturing it and raising the American flag, which was replaced hours later by a larger flag. Schlutz was a member of this patrol and present at the first flag raising helped raise the replacement flag on Sarabaki. He was wounded in action on March 13th and was evacuated off the island. He went on to a 30-year career with the U.S. Postal Service in Los Angeles after recovering from his wounds. He was engaged to a woman after the war, but she died of a brain tumor before they could wed, said his stepdaughter, Desreen McDowell. Schlutz married McDowell's mother at the age of 63. 
And the last of the six Marines, Zach Anderson. Sergeant Michael Strank, born November 10th, 1919, to Vasil Strank, later in the U.S. known as Charles Strank and Marta Grofikova, Ukrainian Lemko immigrants in the former Czechoslovakia, now in Slovakia. He had two brothers and a sister who, all, who were all born in the United States. Michael's father moved to Pennsylvania and worked near Pittsburgh as a coal miner, miner until he could afford to send for his family. Michael enlisted in the Marines in 1939 after his high school graduation in 1937. In April 1941, he was promoted to corporal and was serving in North Carolina when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor in December 1941. By 1945, he had been promoted to sergeant and on February 23rd was in charge of three Marines who were to replace the small flag with a larger one sent up from the battleships below. On March 1st, leading his squad under heavy fire and taking cover, Strank was killed. He was the first of the three flag raisers to die in action. On January 13th, 1949, his remains were reinterred in grave 7197, section 12 of Arlington National Cemetery. In 2008, it was learned that Strank, while a naturalized citizen when his father became a citizen, had not received his documentation. His, certi her, his certification was presented to his sister in 2008 due to the efforts of Marine Gunnery Sergeant Matt Blaze. Sergeant Michael Strank was idolized by his men, with one calling him a Marine's Marine. And in their honor, and so we always remember what they fought for, and not to give away their sacrifice, the Marines' hymn. <laughs> Thank you. I'm now going to, uh, I want to acknowledge another group that helped with this tremendously, the 9-11 Memorial Committee. Joe D'Antona right here, Frank D'Angelo, Ashley Yondo, who's our singer, but she's working and she has a little baby. And I want to ask the Vice Chairman of the 9-11 Committee to come up and uh, say a few words. Patrick O'Malley. Thank you, Charlie. Um, first and foremost, I'd like for all the veterans to stand that are here today, all of our veterans. Let's applaud them because you know what? We don't have a country if we don't have our veterans, our servicemen, and our service women. It's just the way it is. And for all of our young people that are here, when you see a veteran, thank him for his service. Because I really mean this. Like, you know what I mean, whatever we have going on in our life is minute to what in comparison to what we're talking about here today. There wouldn't be a United States of America if there wasn't a Mount Sarabachi. There just wouldn't be. I mean, we should thank our veterans all the time. Our servicemen and servicewomen are fighting on behalf of our freedoms all over the world, every single day. Now, getting back to today, 75 years ago, three young men lost their lives while six of them went up the mountain, three died after the fact in battle to raise that flag. Let's talk about our flag. Our flag is the most fabulous flag ever. It drapes our caskets of our heroes. It's flown at our government buildings. And it's flown outside of our houses. And it's flown into battle and carried into battle. We are not a country without that flag. That flag is the part of the lifeblood of our country. And it really matters to all of us. And when it was risen up on Mount Sarabachi that day, 
that was to show that we were in control. We were taken back over. We were going to be running it. That's what was happening that day. A lot of sacrifice, a lot of blood, and a lot of love was lost in those battles leading up to when they finally took complete control of that island. And that should never, ever, ever be forgotten. So when everyone's out there in their regular daily life and you see a veteran, thank them. Thank them for their service. Thank them for their sacrifice. And to all those that are up above us, thank them. Because if it wasn't for their sacrifice, we wouldn't be here today. And I'd like to thank the Marine Corps League that does a job second to none. And please, if anybody has an opportunity, when they do a flag retirement period, it's beautiful. They have a special ceremony. The flag is burned in the proper way that it needs to be done. And they involve the Boy Scouts to let them understand that service is what our country is about in giving back. I'd like to thank everyone for coming out today. And I'd like to especially thank the Marine Corps League. Tremendous day. The weather's fabulous. Thank you very much, everyone.
Our next honored guest is Staff Sergeant Ed O'Donnell. I'm sorry, that's Corporal Benny Ciciloni and Staff Sergeant Ed O'Donnell. All right. <laughs> hey, improvise, adapt, and overcome, guys. You got it. We need to pause and remember the honor and legacy that they brought to our nation as our nation's greatest generation. Battlefields may change, but the spirit instilled, instilled in every Marine of every generation remains the same. The power of today's Navy, Marine Corps team remains the same. We get there, we fight, and we win. Semper Fidelis. Hurrah! Those three gentlemen were there 75 years ago today. And thank goodness they're still with us to be honored here and to give us the benefit of their presence. Thank you. I'd like now to call on Tom Rummerfield to give us our benediction. It will be followed by the firing salute and taps, and our ceremony today will be concluded. Tom? Marines, uncover! God of Victory, we thank you for the men and women who answered the call to protect our nation. Bless them and bless their families. We ask you to guide our leaders, grant them the wisdom to discern every action of war so that those who serve will always have full confidence in their missions. May a lasting peace be obtained. May that peace you give us be the peace we share with all. Amen. Cover. Huh? <laughs> 